Greetings here, Tommy Heffern down here in the bottom right hand corner, veterinary consultant. I'm going to do a presentation on calf health. I'm going to look at a number of factors. I do one of these kind of bigger ones every year, put it out through YouTube, put it out through the internet um, for farmers. It's looking at calf health. Obviously, the role of an application of precision microbes will be involved as well. So I'd like to think about you know lifetime performance. So this will be really focused on dairy calves, particularly our replacement heifers. Um, but any calf is going to be important. So as so you come into our seasonal system here in Ireland, um, this is a very timely reminder as well of the seven essentials of calf health. Some of the lessons I've learned from traveling for the last 12 months across Europe, meeting farmers and vets and looking at calf health. And then looking finally at the applications of precision microbes and why uh, at 30 mils daily per calf from birth, long term, it is a real game changer. 21 years, uh, I'm a vet, very, very passionate about veterinary and these are definitely the most exciting products I have got to work with. We're getting experience from Ireland, the UK, across Europe, and now in Australia as well. So really exciting. Okay, so let's look at calf health. Um, just for people who don't, know, who don't know Precision Microbes, we're a biological biome focus, focus solutions company. We're based in Dublin. Um, we're a licensed manufacturer Department of Agriculture. We're organic certified. We're exporting to 12 countries. We have a range of products. And huge thanks to everybody, all the farmers and vets out there who are supporting our calf product to this point and all our products. Um, the real message of this is that 30 mils daily from birth, um, re really, you know, the reduction of calf health challenges. So as a tool, it's huge. And what I'm seeing consistently now from probably thousands of farms is the reduction of scour severity when the product is fed long term. So calves, okay, may still get scour or diarrhea, but the recovery times, the setback isn't as much. And I think I'll talk about the emotional cost of disease and how beneficial this is for people. So that's precision microbes. Um, so if we look at, this is a really interesting area of research. So one of the reasons I love this project is uh, I'm given free reign to go off and think about things and look and research and see where our products are, are working well, what we need to do differently, what we need to do better. But if we look at future lifetime performance, so we look at the pre-weaning period, the young calf, uh, we look at gut health and gut development in the young calf, this is really exciting because it not only affects the calf in the first weeks of life, but it's also playing a huge role in lifetime performance. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that first. Again, we'll talk about precision microbes as a tool in aiding uh, and improving that gut health and performance in young calves as well. So if we look at early health and lifetime performance, there's a lot of papers, I've been reading a good few of them recently, um, going through um, average daily gain. So increased average daily gain uh, in the first weeks or the weeks leading up to weaning time and around weaning time is significantly been linked to lifetime performance and yield. So for your Frisian heifer calves or your, uh, your heifer calves, dairy heifer calves going into the parlor, their lifetime performance is improved if their daily gain, average daily gain is improved um, or, or there is a significant input, impact on better average daily gains and better lifetime performance. There's also research looking at the reduction of antibiotics or antibiotic usage increasing and in negatively, uh, the reverse negatively impacting milk production of first lactation. So there's a lot of papers on this uh, that can be read, but it kind of makes sense, this whole idea of epigenetics. And I think this is really, we know that we breed our calves, genetics of our calves for a certain output, but when we think about epigenetics, then that is the influence that um, the environment and other factors have on the phenotype of the animal. And this is really important for young calves because the young gut's not fully developed. We know and are learning a lot about colostrum and colostrum is impacting not just the immunity piece, but future lifetime performance. And again, I've become an advocate for really zoning in on feeding calves in the pre-weaning period. I, I think in seasonal systems where we've got damp, uh, wet and miserable conditions, feeding makes a huge difference. And then look at the environmental factors and challenges like cold, etc., overstocking, all those kind of things that can affect the genetic potential of the animal development. And I think a really nice, simple example of that is in the bee world. So if we think about the larvae, the drone and the queen bee, they come out of the same larvae. The queen bee 
it feeds on royal jelly. Um, the queen bee becomes twice the size of the drone or the worker bee, lives for two and a half years, whereas the worker bee only lives for about four to five weeks. They're on the ordinary honey. So I suppose it's the idea of epigenetics over time um, affecting the phenotype, the genetics that the animal is born with. And this is really important area of research and interest in calves. We look at colostrum feeding and environmental factors as well. If we think about our dairy replacement heifers, we know in Ireland it is a significant, uh, no matter where you go, economic cost. Okay, Now even, there's a talk about the environmental impact of animals that are unproductive. So if we think about dairy heifers, um, they're not going to uh, be productive until they're producing milk. It's different with our beef animals, they're going to be productive when they're, you know, when they're slaughtered for meat. But we know that there's a cost to rearing replacement heifers. And there's some new metrics I think that's interesting. So I read a lot of papers and go to a lot of talks and listen to a lot of YouTube videos about calves. Probably one of my favorite subjects is still calves. And it's like looking at maximizing efficiency, rearing efficiency. So this is the percent of heifers born alive that reach the parlor uh, before 22, 24 months. You can set your target at 24 months. And then another nice target to look at on farm is heifer effectiveness. These are new ones that you'd be kind of assessing. And this is your rearing efficiency percentage uh, um, plus the number of heifers that complete tree lactation. So we're really trying to get to the, he the heifers at the right weight to the parlor in the right numbers and then that they're going to complete a number of lactations. And amazingly, the pre-wean period is influencing young heifers and the factors involved are colostrum, feeding and the environment we rear them in. So again, I've been doing a lot of traveling, so I'm going to give some tips on rearing heifers as well or rearing calves uh, this spring. So as a vet, uh, we always talk, you know, we talk about the cost of disease. You know, if you look at any study, so there's lots of different studies in different countries looking at statistics around what is causing young calves pre-weaning to die. And it's scour and respiratory disease. Probably two-thirds, 60-70% on average, no matter what country in the world you go to, um, diarrhea is the number one cause of calf mortality. Um, calf pneumonia is a close second. Um, but this is where we... You know, we, we talk about the cost of disease and future lifetime performance. But I'm regularly reminded by customers who've come to me and told me about precision microbes as a game changing tool on their farms. The emotional cost of disease, and particularly we think about calf scour, and we think about a busy seasonal system, a lot of calves with diarrhea, the emotional impact of losing calves, treating sick calves when you're already tired, and more calves continually come into the system and getting sick. This is where, uh, and actually uh, recently a, a, a vet, uh, her husband was a, a dairy farmer, reminded me of this, of why they love the products, because the reduction of severity of calf diary on their farm has been significant with long-term feeding, that's 30 mils a day per calf every day. Uh, and she said to me, do not forget and my husband constantly reminds me of the emotional cost of calf diarrhea and, and your role that we're playing there. So we know the cost of disease is significant. It impacts lifetime performance. But I just want to remind people here of the emotional cost on those minding calves and rearing calves in the springtime of calf diarrhea and disease itself. Okay, so when, if you can see me down here in the bottom corner, when we look at infectious disease, I'm always saying to people we're trying to balance... Uh, there we are, seesawing back and forth. So if we look, we're always trying to draw. Oh, sorry, wrong way. We're trying to drive up immu dr drive up immunity, and we're trying to drive down infection pressure. So if we think about it, drive up immunity and drive down infection pressure. Got that right. And that's what we're trying to do. So immunity is our ability or the animal's ability to fight infection. Infection pressure is the level of bacteria or pathogens animals are exposed to. And this simple seesaw principle has been the basis of me looking at infectious disease and solving problems. Because I look and I go on to farm and think, well, What's impacting immunity? There's a number of factors we're going to discuss them in coming slides. And what is actually driving up infection pressure? Is it the source of disease? Is it hygiene, etc.? So this is a really simple thing. And I'll bring these colors throughout the story of this calf webinar this evening or this morning, whenever you're listening to it, or the middle of the night, middle of the day, whenever it is. But I do want to make a really important point because we think about the seesaw of raising immunity and reducing infection pressure. There's another story, because we think about infection pressure over here, uh, looking up here at pathogens, we think about bad pathogens, bacteria. But remember, 
0.1% of bacteria are, are actually pathogenic. 99.9% .9 of bacteria are commensal, and a lot of bacteria are beneficial. So beneficial microorganisms, beneficial bacteria, are actually over on the immunity piece, as I'll explain as I go along. So we're really changing our concept and thinking about microbes from a beneficial point of view, particularly when we look at health and immunity in calves. Now let's just go through a couple of slides on the actual calf system itself. When we think about, I love systems thinking. Again, if we think about the pre-weaning period as the critical period for calves, we see probably 90% of the issues in, you know, even our young calves are in that first 12 weeks. And it's a real links in a chain. So links in the chain across, you can see my links there, across, across from dry cow nutrition, managing dry cows to calving colostrum all the way along. There's a huge number of links in the chain. And any place, and when I travel, and I've done a lot of traveling over the last couple of months, looking at calf health, one of the key things that I have found is that when we look at attention to detail, consistency, um, and really a focus on kind of small changes over time is what makes for great calf rearing. Uh, and I talk about this 1% rule, so it's about identifying the bottlenecks, these weak links in the chain and on different farms, and improving them. And that's the way I think about calf health, because no matter what you do, you know, the weather, there's always external factors that can change, or new diseases maybe, or new people coming onto the farm rearing calves. We need to be constantly focused on making progress. It's all about progress, not perfection for me when it comes to calf health. Again, what are the bottlenecks we look at? You know, colostrogenesis in the cow, feeding the cow to produce better colostrum, hygiene in the calving pens, uh, colostrum hygiene, feeding the calf space, for air, hygiene, water is a new one in calf comfort. So I'm gonna talk about the, the kind of, my top tips as a reminder for farmers as well for the spring ahead. Again, understanding that calf health is so multifactorial, um, I, I, I like processes that are comprehensive, quick and repeatable. Okay, let's give a bit of background into my new favorite subject, which is microbes and the gut microbiome across all species. But if we think about, if we go into the gut of the calf, we think about the digestive tract, and we think about what is the gut microbiome? Uh, representing these microbes here, these trillions of uh, bacteria, viruses, protozoa and fungi, basically um, that are active throughout the, the gut. So there's different microbes in different parts of the gut. The further we go down through the intestines, the more uh, beneficial microorganisms, particularly bacteria, we see. And it's really important that we remember, that we know that this collection of microorganisms in the gut, primarily beneficial microbes, are known as the gut microbiome and that gut microbiome and gut flora has three key roles it's involved in if i can get it in here digestion immune function and competition with harmful pathogens so we really think about a healthy gut microbiome for young calves being really important we'll also discuss how to get their microbiome so the gut microbiome and digestion so even in calves even in young calves Beneficial microorganisms are involved in digesting complex carbohydrates. They're involved in the production of short chain fatty acids, some protein metabolism. We know in young animals how important protein metabolism is. It's production of synthesis of vitamin K and different B vitamins. They regulate gut motility. Think about that. They actually play a very integral part in gut barrier function. And I think this is important when we think about, well, nutrition in and output, as I'll explain uh, in the next slide. Because when I've always looked at this, and I've always had an interest in animal nutrition, we always think in performance animals that it's, you know, quality food in, be it enough milk or quality milk replacer um, or concentrates as calves get older, quality food in equals output because of digestion. But I have learned that I think this is a really important factor that there is another there's another part of this equation, and it's the quality food in plus absorption equals output. So the gut is like a sponge. So if we do, if we have put quality food into a poor performing gut, uh, an unhealthy gut microbiome, well, it's going to impact absorption and that will impact the output, be it in growth, that we're looking for in an average daily gain setting. So, um, and I think if we put poor quality food in, uh, well, that's really going to impact the gut microbiome, which is going to further impact absorption. So we need to think about uh, gut health from a digestion and an absorption point of view. 
So why so much immunity in the gut? Well, if we think about it, why so much immunity in the gut? Well, if we think about the surface area, I like talking about humans because we can all think about it. Um, so the size of an adult human digestive tract, if you lay out the surface area, is the size of a tennis court. That's huge. And calves are about the quarter of that, about quarter size of a tennis court. That's why we have so much immune cells in the gut, because it's a huge surface area of exposure to outside digesta coming in um, with the potential for harmful pathogens as well as digesta. So that's why so much of the immune system is focused in the gut. Reminder again, 70% of immunity on average is focused in our calves digestive tract. Why is that important? Well, if we get disruption to the gut microbiome, the gut microbes talk all the time crosstalk between the gut microbes and immune system you get excess inflammation in the gut when there's uh, uh, when there's problems and that will impact the gut microbiota the gut microbiota will impact the immune system and causing further inflammation and that will impact overall immunity so that's why gut and immunity is so important Again, we don't have to get too worried about the detail, but I love this, the idea of good versus bad bacteria. We think about how the bacteria in the digestive tract work. They compete for nutrients. So if we have the right population of bacteria in our calves gut microbiome, some bacteria will produce postbiotics, remember that word, uh, producing bactericins and organic acids that will compete with harmful pathogens. They occupy space. They can control pH and oxygen. So that's another role that the good bacteria do. So if I think about it in a healthy gut microbiome, this is what nice cell integrity looks like. Two layers of mucin, regulated immune cells, a healthy population of good bacteria, an oversimplification possibly, but better digestion, regulating immunity and competition. When we get disruption in the gut microbiome, we often get acute disruption like acute diarrhea. That can have an impact in the short term. And then when we have chronic inflammation, we have a lowering of diversity of the good bugs, a proliferation of harmful pathogens, we get essentially a leaky gut, that protective layer of mucus of protection is degraded and overall absorption is decreased. And also inflammation is increased, which causes a lot of problems. Again, how do good and bad bacteria compete with each other? Think about postbiotics. We're gonna be talking about that in a little bit as well. Again, I think this is fascinating because for a number of reasons. So as a company, Precision Micros, we're doing some really interesting work um, over, you know, behind the scenes, thinking next year and five years ahead of time, what's happening. And we're looking at building data as well on the biome of different farms. So how do calves even get their microbiome? So if you imagine me as a calf coming through the vagina, I am actually picking up vaginal microbes from the, the mother. That's how calves, with pretty sterile gut when they're, when they're in uterus. There is some mi microbes in there, but pretty sterile. Vaginal delivery, also picking up some fecal microbes and then the environmental microbes when they land out on the ground. What this is, why this is important is these microbes that calves are uh, exposed to create a fingerprint for or uh, seeding out the young garden of the gut. So the calf is heavily influ influenced by the dam's microbiome. Now we're looking at the dam's microbiome for a number of reasons uh, at Precision Micros, but also it's of huge interest when we think about methane, et cetera, et cetera. And farms can have uh, their own microbiome fingerprints. So some really interesting work been done in that area. So if we think about the farm gut microbiome, this is something we are, are looking at. I'll tell you why. We've just finished a 15-month trial in pigs, a very extensive trial, and it's been absolutely outstanding. We've, we've looked at the growth of performance, things that you'd expect, but we've also picked up some really nice uh, positive benefits from focusing on the farm biome and sow biome. I think it's something we'll be looking at in the future in cows. And basically, that the farm gut biome, in an ideal world, the cow is passing all the right microbes to the calves. Um, but what we're seeing is a very different story. There's a diversity of microbes, good and bad, going to calves that are heavily influencing the farm and young calf biome. We were involved with a 15-month trial on pigs where the pig farm had a very high level of salmonella. We looked at actually eliminating salmonella over six months, and it's been in a zero score now for over actually 12 months now, sorry, a little bit longer even than I've said, um, uh, with zero salmonella score. No other changes in the farm other than a focus on precision microbes 
at the sow biome level. So this is a really interesting area, I think, in the future, when we look at farm biomes and how the cow will influence calves. And if we think about where do all these pathogens that cause scour, scour come from, anyway, they come from the cow. I was doing a lot of work with crypto over the years where we sample cows and see the crypto in the cow's dung in low doses, initially being the source of infection for the calves. And then they multiply it uh, because of their immunonaive syst or, uh, digestive systems. Okay, so precision microbes, I keep saying it, but I have to say it. I think this is such an exciting tool. It's an extraordinary tool. But here are some tips on calf health this spring, areas to focus on. Seven areas, key areas for calf rearing that I think uh, are essential. So here we are, seven essentials of calf rearing. Colostrum, we know that colostrum is all about the immunity story. The calf is born immunonaive. The immunoglobulins that it gets from its dam comes through um, milk, the first milk. It's the foundation of calf health. But we are looking at new research into colostrum and how beneficial it is to the development of the young gut. One of the areas I think that we're very, very weak on in farm is hygiene of colostrum. And what I mean by that is colostrum has got twice the fat and protein of ordinary milk. It's a lovely medium for some harmful pathogens to grow in. We need to do better in that space. So when we think about colostrum, it's really about seeding out the young gut. We do not want that seeding of the young gut to be harmful pathogens. So be very mindful of when we're storing and managing colostrum on farm, we need to do better. I think we've got really good on the quantity, the three to four liters, the quickly, in the first two to six hours, um, and the quality of colostrum, that it's over 25% in a BRICS refractometer, has a certain amount of level of antibodies. But we need to do better on the cleanliness and hygiene piece. Again, if we think about this, um, if we look at um, an electron microscope, looking at colostrum proteins, this is what the healthy gut looks like, nice feel like, digestion of colostrum proteins. But what happens when we get harmful pathogens like E. coli completely disrupting enterocytes and cells? This is what we don't want. So E. coli in particular, coli farms do a lot of propagation and growth. They double every 20 minutes. And one of the areas of research is, and a lot of research is pointing out, but practically as well. So I still do a lot of work with vets and farmers around building calf health plans. And one of the areas where we've got massive success in is a focus on hygiene and handling of colostrum. Again, we're, I won't get into it in too much detail, but we're taking a look, a deeper look at what's in colostrum that's not in milk. There's all these properties in it. This again is the epigenetic factors, the development of the young gut. This is a really exciting field. And again, colostrum actually contains prebiotics. And um, these prebiotics help develop the young gut. Just be mindful again of the research on uh, this is an Irish study looking at the role of um, contamination. Again, don't forget about the importance of transition milk. This is a really nice, interesting study done by Van Sust et al. in 2022. Look at the difference between calves fed transition milk versus milk replacer. So these calves went from colostrum straight to milk replacer and the difference is huge. So just be mindful of that colostrum to milk piece. Don't forget about transition milk. Again, this is a study done, I think, by in Canada looking at colostrum feeding and its impact on the gut microbes. Um, so colostrum has a big impact on the development of the gut and the development of the gut microbiome because it's got these oligosaccharides in it. It's just colostrum is nature's liquid gold. So number two area for focus for me is feeding the calf. We'll have all the conversations around whole milk versus milk replacer. We might see farmers feeding more whole milk this year because of the price of milk. Uh, again, we'll have that conversation of milk replacer or skim versus whey. I've become a real component, proponent of simplicity and biological optimization. What does that mean? In simple terms, I always think about now is what does an animal want? What does a calf want? How many times a day will it suckle? Probably 8 to 12. How many litres will it suckle? Probably 10 to 14 litres, if it's allowed. Now, why that's important is that the biological and behavioural optimization. that's what it's like to do. The further we move the calf away from that, the more stress we create and the more challenges we create on its immune system and metabolic health. So, within reason, I try and look for biological optimization in calves to great effect. It means simply more milk, 
often in simple terms. Massive difference as well when we look at variable weather because we do not underestimate the impact of immunity on underfeeding and a stress metabolic system. And remember, we're never going to get as much value for a kilo of dry matter in as a kilo of average daily gain in weight. The other thing I would say from traveling extensively, looking at the farms that have a massively reduced disease incidence and burdens, particularly digestive incidence, they tend to have very little issues with feeders and they tend to clean them on a regular basis, twice a day after feeding, once a day minimum. So that's something I've observed. So one of the things is I like doing is going out and, and reading research and thinking about it. But most importantly, I actually like to go to high performing farms across the world and see what they're doing well and see for any links and consistency between these really high performing farms that are doing a good job what are they doing well? And sadly, I'm afraid they're doing the basics. They're being brilliant at the basics, doing the simple things really well. That's my finding from a, a deep dive of that over the last couple of years. Again, attention to detail and consistency are key for calves. I, again, if we look at milk replacers, we look at nutrition, the quality of the protein is really key. So I will hear a lot of people talking about skim versus whey, uh, the percentage of protein, 24, 26, so I've got 28. But think about protein as amino acids, as the building blocks. Animal protein is key. The quality of that protein is key. I've seen calves perform better on a 20% protein uh, milk replacer than 24% because literally the, the protein quality was better. Also, fat percentage of milk replacers is really important. It's a conversation we really need to think about with smaller calves, Jersey crosses or Jersey calves, particularly when we look at whole milk versus milk replacer, I think a higher fat or oil percentage and be careful about those oils, which kind of oils they actually are. And again, we need water from day one. We need concentrate going in. I'm a fan of more milk. Certainly more milk has been probably my number one piece of advice on farm visits in the last three years. As simple as that. Can you imagine that? Uh, an overqualified veterinary consultant coming out and telling people just as your main advice to feed a little bit more milk. I think we're not seeing more scour with more milk. And again, with precision microbes as a tool um, with extra milk feeding, I think the calf performance is just outstanding. And I have a video coming up that will kind of outline from a farmer where they've seen that. I think with, with, with definitely with higher milk feeding, and I'm not talking about going through the roof like 12 or 14 or ad-lib milk. I'm talking about moving even from 6 litres at 125 grams per litre, 6 litres of whole milk, to 8, 7, 8 litres a day. And a lot of farms, that's all we're doing. And again, gradual weaning then really, I think, leads to sustained gains. Um, so if I look at uh, another simple one, number three, when it comes to calf health, my God, this is going to be a short video. It's going to be a really long one. But if you're in advance of calving, I hope you're spending time listening to this because I think there's some really nice tips on it. Um, um, so hygiene is, is, is really key. And when we think about hygiene, I want you to think about two elements to hygiene. The first thing we want to do is uh, detergent. So that brings down the biofilm and the scale. And then we want to disinfect. So we want to use a detergent first and then disinfectant. The best detergent on the market I can find still is Fairy Liquid. Um, Fairy Liquid even have this lovely new one that's got a, uh, a disinfectant in it. But it basically, uh, a detergent will remove lime, sc lime scale and biofilm, uh, particularly where we have uh, important implements like colostrum. So where we're harvesting colostrum in buckets, I think it really needs attention to detail. And then for highly critical equipment, a good detergent, good wash, um, and so critical equipment in something like Milton. That's what I do on farm. That's what I advise on farm. But we're trying to reduce infection pressure. Um, even if we're, if we're washing uh, feeding equipment on a, a daily basis with high pressure water, that's really important. I don't know where I pulled this from, but 50% of calf diseases are related to poor hygiene. I think they are. And I think really, I think where we see a good job and cleaning around feeding equipment in particular, we see a lot less issues with digestive health. Okay, so if I think about this one next as the kind of number four essential of calf rearing, fresh air and ventilation. So what does fresh air do? Well, fresh air reduces down pathogens. It actually kills them. It contains a thing called ozone, which actually is a nature's natural disinfectant. It also keeps things dry and makes damp and moist conditions. So fresh air and drainage are key to get right because we think about bugs, the harmful bugs, they absolutely love 
damp conditions uh, and moist conditions. So fresh air, plenty of fresh air, and don't forget to get that drainage right. They're two key elements. Uh, but the problem is when it comes to ventilation, every shed is different. Our noses are still the most accurate way of, you know, we don't want to get that smell of, uh, of ammonia in sheds. You know, I was in a farm recently, a uh, beautiful shed, but a lot of issues with ammonia. Ventilation was just not at the races and a lot of moisture build up in the shed. So reduce down the moisture, increase the fresh air. And um, the problem is, yes, of course, when we put more fresh air into the shed, go over that two meters per second square, uh, two meters per second sp wind speed, we can create the negative impact of cold and reduction of immunity. So this is where I find more feeding of milk or calf jackets in combination with more open sheds and good drainage working really well for me. But warning, and a severe warning at that, every shed is different because of the position of it on farm and um, access etc is different so it's a very sh uh, farm specific challenge number five is a really simple one again i would have done a nuffield farming scholarship in 2018 would have traveled the world would have looked at really kind of uh, in-depth look at animal nutrition animal health on dairy farms and again if th this is a really simple idea it comes back to the cow signals as well but really works providing calves with a dry, warm lie, plenty straw, being mindful that uh, pre-weaned young calves on milk, their thermal neutral zone is 15 degrees. So under 15 degrees Celsius, these calves become cold and the colder it gets, the more metabolic shock that has and the more milk they will need or, or else they will uh, stop, regress, perform poorly and in really severe circumstances and prolonged cold, it will have a very direct impact on their immune system. The other thing I would say that I've really been observing for a long period of time now and makes complete sense is the, prov the provision of painkillers and anti-inflammatories at the time of dehorning. Because when you burn something, it's always 24 hours later it gets sore. And any time there's pain, pain limits performance and a burn is really, really sore. So for dehorning calves, anti-inflammatories, sedation and local anesthetic is a game changer. We need to be doing that. So ultimately, um, I'm bombing through these, these essentials of calf rearing. We want to minimize stress on calves. Okay, we know that. We want to minimize stress on ourselves as well. Um, part of this project has allowed me to work on the human side as well and look at gut health in humans. We all need to reduce stress because stress has a huge impact on gut health. We know there's lots of stressors in calves, and I'll make the point as well in a slide or two time that no matter what we do, there's some stressors there, and that's why precision microbes is the most effective tool I've ever worked with when it comes to calves. So when we think about stress, it releases cortisol. It's certainly part of the flight or fight. Someone jumps in the window of my office here. It's part of me getting out, getting home, getting safe. But if there's prolonged stress all day, every day, which is part of my world, is all these phone calls all day long, that low grade stress releases cortisol. So for calves, it's the stress around feeding, handling, weather, environment changes. That produces cortisol, cortisol gets dumped in the gut. It reduces the diversity of the good bacteria. It reduces that mucus layer that protects. Remember absorption in the gut? It increases motility and leads to poor gut health and immunosuppression. So we want to minimize stress on calves, especially because of its impact on gut health. And we know how important gut health is to overall calf health. Number six when it comes to calf health and rearing is more space. So sometimes uh, I solved a lot of problems with more space and more straw and more milk. Um, but I think really, you know, more space per calf. If we look at the legislation around transport, and particularly from an Irish point of view, we're going to have to keep calves on farm longer. I'm a huge advocate for two meters squared per calf as your minimum target for, for space. It pays long term, particularly when we look at heifers and future lifetime performance. Sometimes maybe it could be just the more principles of calf rearing, more colostrum, more milk, more space, more straw, more air and more hygiene and microbes on top of that. Again, 
One of the last areas in calf health I want to talk about, but I think it's really important, is um, when we think about reducing infection pressure, we often don't think about water and calf health. So we often think about water coming from mains or maybe a well into our system. We often test water out here. We never think about water's journey and our farms getting longer. We never think about header tanks between seasons. We think about all our automated feeders now, which have been excellent help to calf rearing, but we don't want uh, water that's got contaminants in, in it going in to be mixed with powder in warm and heat. So water quality has become really important. The other thing is when we have lots of pipe work and uh, poor water flow and header tanks, we can get the buildup of this biofilm slime in pipes. And I have seen it on farm and it really impacts um, bacterial overgrowth, particularly coliforms. Here is me doing some testing on a farm, looking at uh, an ATP meter. So this meter, you want to have it under 50, no more than 500 uh, as your top reading. And this header tank on this farm was 55,000. So really when we think about water quality, it's often overlooked. It's not on every farm, but we need to think about it because it can significantly impact gut health and calf health. Remember that gut, we want to minimize those coliforms, particularly where we're looking at automated feeders. Water quality should be something we're looking at. So stress in the gut microbiome. If you have listened to Tommy for 35 minutes and you're doing these seven things well. You are optimizing gut health and you have the healthiest calves in Ireland, maybe the world. But unfortunately, I'm yet to meet you because every farm has some degree of stress related to scale, size and just the challenge of farming. Um, we have challenges there. And this is why we're always focused on getting the basics right. But precision microbes as a tool is an absolute game changer when it comes to improving gut health and calf health long term. So I'm going to talk about precision microbes now. It is a must. I'm putting my absolutely. I would hope people um, are either very annoyed with me because I'm so happy, happy about calves, but um, are, are actually believe I genuinely love this uh, area of calf health. And again, 21 years qualified, I am putting everything I've ever learned and known, any reputation, I think these products are absolute game changers. So once in a career, or once in a lifetime opportunity to work on actually a revolutionary animal health project like this. This is how big I think these products are from a perspective of what I've seen so far. So let's talk about practical applications of precision micro. So we're looking at 30 mils daily per calf, fed in milk. So it can be mixed in milk from birth. Uh, a lot of farms will be doing 30 mils for 30 days uh, and that's you know about 900 mils per calf. But I think really with replacement heifers or, or if we're really targeting optimizing calf health, it's up to until weaning. What has been so consistent across farms is the reduction in the severity of calf scour. And remember I said early on about the emotional cost of disease. So um, what farms are saying consistently is, okay, we still may get a certain level of calf diarrhea. We may, all calves may still get uh, calf diarrhea or get sick with calf diarrhea, but nowhere near the tubing, the oral fluids, the rehydration work, the sickness of calves, their recovery is much quicker on this long-term uh, protocols. And we are apples when we look at everything else in the market when it comes to supplementation. And you know, people have talked to me even about products trying to copy or new products coming to the market, looking at this concept that we're doing. Fine, because that means we're doing something right. I've said from the very beginning when I finished the trial work, I said these are game changers in gut health. These are apples within the orange community and really good apples. Uh, there's nothing wrong with oranges either, but you know what I mean. This is like I mean this is really different. We think about the use of microbes and we're game changers in this space. So um, this is why precision microbes is game changer. I think I have a video.
over here, but what I'm going to get you to do is go to the website, www.precisionmicrobes.com. Just listen, www.precisionmicrobes.com. Listen to farmer and vets talking about the difference the products have made on their farm. Okay, why are we different? Well, if we think about gut microbes and the gut microbiome, well then, um, if we think about that, well, it kind of makes sense that... Um, well, good bacteria in there, probiotics, let's put more in. And that's simply what we've been doing for the last number of decades with the idea that we're going to improve digestion, we're going to help regulate immunity, and we're going to compete with harmful pathogens. Makes a little bit of sense. But like me and like all the research, inconsistent results is something I had seen with all the probiotics in the market I'd used up to this point, uh, say post, uh, pre Three, so we'll go back three years ago, every, I used every probiotic, every calf supplement, because I was doing so much work with calves, and not just in the Irish market, I was working internationally, I tried so many things, but I had seen inconsistent results. And there's a really important why. We are a liquid, so every other product, we're completely different to the liquid nature. So it's the first of its kind, liquid, pro and postbiotic in the market. We're licensed to the Department of Agriculture, we're organic certified. There's two applications with precision microbes, calf pro and postbiotics. At higher doses, we can help cows, calves recover from scour. And then at lower doses for long term, it's where the product was designed to optimize digestive health and calf performance. If you go to our website, you will see these are very visual products. If you get the, I talk about all health beginning in the gut, health from the inside out, you know, um, and we're getting more and more data all the time on long-term benefits as well from the calf products. And I think it's a real game-changing tool for effective calf rearing, particularly when we look at antibiotic reduction and the challenges around sustainability. We have a biological product, organic, biological, science-driven product that's driving and improving calf health and reducing antibiotics at a very, very big level now on farms up and down the country and further afield, as I said, as far away as Australia now. So why are we different? Well, we're a pro and postbiotic liquid. The probiotics are like the good bacteria. Um, they're like factories. It's actually what they produce, the postbiotics that are really important. You would have heard me mention postbiotics earlier on when I talked about how some bacteria produce postbiotics like organic acids and tyrosins to compete with other bacteria. Some postbiotics people will know is actually ivermectin is a postbiotic. Yes, it was a metabolite of a streptomyces bacteria and also penicillin, I think, was a postbiotic because it was in a metabolite of a fungus, uh, penicillin rubin. So postbiotics are actually what the good bacteria produce, the probiotics. And we have a liquid that contains pro and postbiotics. So if we think about postbiotics, these are some of my colors just to explain. And again, I'm going to keep these couple of slides for the interest of time. Stick with me for another 15 minutes, okay? I really want you to stick with me. I've given you some tips and calves. Just listen and understand about the practical applications, if you don't mind, if you've got time. Um, a lot of farmers now hopefully are watching this because their cows are dry and are thinking about calf health for the season ahead. Think about postbiotics, okay? So postbiotics are a really important part of the story. So prebiotics are the feed for good bacteria. Colostrum contains prebiotics. Uh, probiotics are the beneficial bacteria and postbiotics are what they produce. So when we go down to a cellular level in the gut, this is important because if we think about it, prebiotics, they feed the good bacteria and the good bacteria produce postbiotics. And it's actually the postbiotics that are involved in the digestion, they're involved in the immunity piece. Let's see if I hear, they actually are, the, it's the postbiotics do do the crosstalk between the bacteria and the immune cells, and they also provide protection. Um, these are the enterocins, bactericins, lactic acid, uh, nitrous oxide, and these postbiotics actually inhibit bad bacteria. So really important we think about it is, so these are the cells in the gut here. This is uh, the cells, each cell here, the transcellular uh, boundaries here, and uh, nice tight cell junctions, the mucus layer protectium, the good bacteria, and the postbiotics are key. Postbiotics also interact with the immune system. So the past and the future. So what we've been doing with probiotic bacteria for a long, long time is freeze drying them. This is what they look like under electron microscope. So culturing them, putting them into a centrifuge and dehydrating them makes it easy to do. Um, and people have said, God, this liquid you have is fantastic. Can you make it into a powder? No. This is why, because when we have a freeze dried bacteria, it has to reactivate and produce its metabolites or postbiotics. Whereas in our liquids, 
we actually propagate the microorganisms using unique herbs to culture them in a liquid until they're in their log stationary phase, producing the good bacteria uh, uh, in the right numbers per mill and all these postbiotics as well. And if we think about the gut again, if you can remember a healthy gut, well, or a dysbiotic or unhealthy gut, it's actually the postbiotics that are the key element. Whether we look at repair, and I've done webinars in the past detailing out the different postbiotics and how they functionally help with stabilization, like butyrate and all the cytokines it produces and helps stimulate recovery. But also the postbiotics are involved in actual uh, gut health and function. And remember, we have many beneficial microbes and many postbiotics in here. So this is a game-changing product. And I think about the gut like a sponge. Remember, a couple of key points I always go back to. Simplicity is key to me, but nutrients in plus absorption equals output. Well, if the gut's not performing, well, then output's not the calves aren't going to perform and also the immune system is going to be compromised 70 percent of the immune systems in the gut this is a problem again the difference between what we're doing and what everybody else is doing in this space is massive and i think we're it's a bold statement and i'm hopefully i'll be around to see it that if we continue with the success and the results we're seeing which we are um, we're going to change how gut health supplements uh, are used and should be used because this is the format we need for actually for the best usage. Also, we use herbs to propagate the microbes. A lot of our IP intellectual property is related there. There's so many factors to what we do um, that's complex and really different um, and really unique. Okay, so two main applications for our calves. For farmers who've seen the product working, and this is so important, if you're a farmer and you've seen the product working to, for recovery for your calves, so stabilization, following diarrhea, so you've got calves with diarrhea, you've been using microbes like so many farmers, hundreds of farmers I've spoken to, used it as a helping recovery. Get this product into your calves early this year. If you didn't see it working, don't ever use the product again. Give out about microbes, give out about Tommy. But it, most farmers have seen a pretty positive reaction to this product in scoury calves. Get it in at lower doses to healthy calves, because that's what it was designed for. Support gut health and immunity. Use it properly to see the real massive benefits. Uh, and, and join a huge community now of farmers who are using the product long term. And I think that's really the way to go. So if you've seen the product working, I'd encourage you to look at the benefits of long term feeding 30 mils from birth a day. Again, it can be used as stabilization uh, for some farms. Again, if we think of it, I did a lot of trial work in the early days um, on uh, calves with diarrhea through vet practices. I think we did 10 farm trials when we look at 10 calves and 10 control 10 treatment and we've just tried to measure speed of recovery and um, probably overall those farms and i have one major problem is a lot of those farms actually treated the control group with the product because they saw the treatment group recovering so quick so i think it was about set five of those farms actually i could use as uh, actual um as benchmarks and the recovery was on average two times faster with microbes depending on the pathogens of course etc um, but that's what precision microbes has got its name for at 60 mils a day or in a severe sick calf 60 mils twice daily it's the speed of recovery um, a biological solution again if we think about the postbiotic that's really key and again it makes sense what happens when your calf has got diarrhea well gut transit time is speeded up and it makes sense that you want to put microbes in in live format, particularly postbiotics. And that's why we're seeing such results. Again, here are some protocols for recovery. Um, probably for me, for dairy calves, 60 mils orally or true milk. So the product is ideal true milk. It's highly palatable um, for five to seven days with calves recovery. Um, and all the trial work I did improved appetite earlier on tri all trial work. So that's we got calves drinking. Um, EC face CMN CIMB 10415 is licensed for gut stabilization. Conscious at times, you can use it with antibiotics. It's another brilliant thing about the pro and postbiotic liquid. Okay, antibiotics will damage the gut. They could also take out probiotics, but they won't take out the postbiotics. So it can be fed if calves are on antibiotics, can be fed in conjunction with that. So it's an ideal product if you're using Gabrivet or Parafor, Paramycin. Two can be fed together. Gabavet tackling the crypto, precision micros targeting improving gut health. So long term usage, this is where the game is at, and this is what's really exciting. So using the product every day. We know that in every system, no matter what we do, there's going to be some stresses on calves. That stress will impact gut health. That gut health will affect calf performance, 
immunity and lead to more pathogens and problems. So we're really focusing on long-term usage. Last season, 2023, I can't believe I'm talking about 2024, but I am. We had, a, we had a campaign of 30 mils for 30 days. In Irish seasonal systems, that worked really well. But a lot of farmers here, like you'll hear like the likes of Kevin O'Hanlon, Peter Hines, and others on our website, actually fed the product right through on all calves up to weaning time because they saw such a difference. Um, and again, on dairy to beef systems, 30 mils daily from arrival to rearing. The long term, it can be given with colostrum, no issues there. Um, I think a minimum period is 10 days, so 30 mils a day for 10 days. And during periods of digestive upsets, this is important. So if you're feeding 30 mils a day per calf, feed it once a day in the morning milk. Um, top up during periods of digestive upset and you'll really see a speed of recovery so if calves do get a digestive upset or diarrhea outbreak top them up with an extra 30 mils and the recovery is really really fast um, again this is a review of trial work there was two independent trials done here on the top you'll see it um, sorry i could go back that's tara's trial and sheena turrell's trial both done wit we bought um all the assets for us product they did it independent of ourselves both uh, trials saw improved calf performance and treatment versus control um, there's also another treatment group here with a different product again precision microbes came out on top it replicated what i saw on all my farm trials and um, again i saw an improvement of treatment versus control on all trials but it varied farm to farm so on some farms up to 120 grams a day but some farms it was low as 30 grams because that came down to the level of feeding le level of challenge or uh, level of feeding or challenge on, on farm but what was so consistent is reduction of calf scour and severity, all the farmer, all the trial work. And this is probably why I got so excited and involved so early. It's all the farmers in the trials wanted to buy the product because they could see appetite and calf figure improved. And over all the trials I did as well, antibiotic reduction on long-term feeding. We're available through your vet practice in Ireland. Anyone has any issues about product or questions as well, don't be afraid, just contact us on info at precisionmicrobes.com we're happy to answer any questions it'll often be me that will be talking to you on the phone so please reach out if you have any questions okay so why long term i think this is my 21 career 21 careers 21 years uh, uh, as a veterinary surgeon a passionate veterinary surgeon these are game changers across species 30 mils daily in milk from day one period of time feeding maybe it's up to the farmer themselves or the vet what you're trying to achieve i would say a minimum myself of 21 days i'd aim for 30 mils for 30 days it's highly palatable um, and what we saw with all the trial work is the real improvements in average daily gain came in the three to four weeks before weaning so really the benefits i'd say particularly in heifers will be from birth to weaning and it makes sense if we're getting improved calf performance during the pre-weaning period which we are well that is going to lead into with heifers better lifetime performance and all the current research is pointing in that direction again hooking to automatic feeders automatic feeders are super all machines are suitable it needs a pump the benefits are well a calf is going through that str transitional stress of a new from whole milk to milk replacer a new environment you know focus on one teat um, and a new way of feeding that stress is a challenge if they're on the product before they're smoothing the transition on they like the taste of it the reduction of digestive issues on feeders is huge it's available in 20 liters now and that's you know just hook your 20 liter into your pump into your machine uh, if you have any questions on hooking up to automatic feeders no problem but gfc phosphor technic uh, and volac uh, and holloman low all those machines are uh, with numbers of farmers that are actually are using those machines gfc have actually installed a new pump into their machine to facilitate precision microbes which is fantastic just a quick mention of calf rearing dairy to beef this will be later in the season there's lots of stress in the calf rearing system we have a calf transported to a new farm a new diet and a new environment that impacts gut health this is highly palatable you can see tara's results here she saw 115 gram a day uh, improvements in her calves uh, and her thesis what she did in 2022 two protocols being used 60 mils a day for set for seven days but really more and more farms now rearing calves are going 60 mils in arrival and then 30 mils daily right up to weaning and it's a game changer in the calf rearing space as well look i think the benefits of precision microbes are huge 
massive reduction in digestive upsets and improvement in appetite. Again, all the trial work that I did, and it was a significant number of calves when you actually tot it up, and I'm still, um, we have a new trial just finishing in autumn 2023, looking at that data at the moment. Again, improved calf performance. Reduction of antibiotics is massive. More milk feeding um, with automated feeders is working really well as well. Improved calf growth rates, and there's a visual difference in calf performance, reduction of interventions and antibiotics. Product can be used uh, for recovery at higher doses, but if you've used it in the past and seen it working, it's now time to think about long term, even at 30 mils for 30 days. Top up with 30 mils during periods of digestive upsets, improved average daily gains, reduction of antibiotics, scour incidence and severity, and best results fed daily in milk long term. More questions, info at precisionmicrobes.com. Thank you for listening to me for 54 minutes, and I don't think I took a breath, as one person said to me recently. Do you actually take a breath when you're presenting? Look, I love the subject. I love calf health. I love making videos. I ho Hopefully, there'll be some practical advice in there about calf rearing in advance of the calf season in Ireland, and a lot of practical information as well about the application of precision microbes. You don't have to ask me again. I'm obviously a massive believer. Maybe I'm incredibly biased, but I think these are game changers in gut health. Happy safe farming for 2024. And a final message out there. I've met lots and lots of farmers over the last 12 months in Ireland, the UK, and across Europe. You are doing a great job. Keep up the good work. I know there's been a lot of negative criticism of farming, but the vast majority of farmers are doing an incredible job, and it's a hard job. So keep up that good work. Calf rearing is an important part of that job and a difficult element of it. So we're delighted to be able to help in a small way. So for me and the team in Precision Microbes, have a good season of 2024 of calf rearing on the farm and have a happy, healthy one yourselves to you and your families as well. Thanks for listening.